Good evening, good morning, and good day wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quest. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season. So all that we do will prosper. This is week 21 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, Prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Exodus. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and the Hebrew English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we give thanks, we give praise to your great and mighty name. May you bless this time that we have this evening. May it be a spirit-filled moment. May it give us wisdom. May we have understanding with what you have to share. May your words inspire those who hear, those who watch the videos. May it be an inspiration to them. May they seek your face. May they walk in your ways, and may they produce fruit for the kingdom and glorify your name. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everyone. A quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. You may download it and follow the study on your laptop, or you may follow the live stream. This is our master schedule, and as you can see, this week's portion includes chapters from Exodus, Jeremiah, and Mark. We are going to deep dive on the Torah portion, and we highly recommend that you would read the Prophets and Yeshua portions at your leisure. This week 21 of our weekly cycle, we are deep diving into the Torah portion, Exodus chapter 25 through 28. Let us begin. This is Exodus chapter 25. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites, and let them bring to me a contribution. You will receive my contribution from every man whose heart prompts him. And this is the contribution that you will receive from them, gold and silver and bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine linen and goat hair, and red dyed ram skins, and fine leather, and acacia wood, oil for the lamp, balsam oils for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for mountings on the ephod and the breastpiece, and make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell in the midst of them, according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its equipment, and so you will do. And they will make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits its length, and a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you will overlay it with pure gold, inside and outside you will overlay it, and you will make on it a gold molding all round. And you will cast for it four gold rings, and you will put them on its four feet, with two rings on its one side and two rings on its second side. And you will make poles of acacia wood, and you will overlay them with gold. And you will put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark with them. And the rings of the ark will be the poles, they will not be removed from it. And you will put into the ark the testimony that I will give to you. And you will make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits its length and a cubit and a half its width. And you will make two cherubim of gold. You will make them of hammered work at the two ends of the atonement cover. And make one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end of the atonement cover. You will make the cherubim on its two ends. And the cherubim will be without spread wings above, covering with their wings over the atonement cover and facing each other. The faces of the cherubim will be toward the atonement cover. And you will put the atonement cover above onto the ark. And into the ark you will put the testimony that I will give you. And I will meet you there, and I will speak with you from over the atonement cover, from between the two cherubim that are to be on the ark of the testimony. All that I will command you to the Israelites. And you will make a table of acacia wood, two cubits its length, and a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. And you will overlay it with pure gold, and you will make for it a gold molding all round. And you will make for it a handbreadth rim all round, and you will make a gold molding for its rim all round. And you will make four gold rings for it, and you will put the rings on the four corners where its four legs are. The rings will be near the rim as holders for poles to carry the table. And you will make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold, and the table will be carried with them. 
and you will make its plates and its ladles and its pitchers and its bowls with which libations will be poured. Of pure gold you will make them, and you will put on the table the bread of presence to be before me continually, and you will make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand will be made of hammered work, its base and its branch, its cups, its buds, and its blossoms will be from it. And six branches will be going out from its sides, three branches of the lampstand from its one side and three branches of the lampstand from its second side. Three almond flower cups will be on the one branch with a bud and a blossom, and three almond flower cups will be on the one branch with a bud and a blossom. Likewise for the six branches going out from the lampstand, and on the lampstand will be four almond flower cups with its buds and its blossoms, and a bud will be under the two branches that come from it, and a bud under the two branches from it and a bud under the two branches from it. Likewise for the six branches coming out from the lampstand, their buds and their branches will be from it, all of it one piece of pure gold hammered work. And you will make it seven lamps, and its lamps will be set up, and it will give light in the space in front of it. And its snuffers and its fire pans will be pure gold. It will be made from a talent of pure gold, with all these pieces of equipment. And see and make all according to their power, which you were shown in the mountain, Thoughts and insights on chapter 25. In this chapter, it's talking about the contributions that are being brought in to make these items. And we're talking about the ark, the table for showbread, and the lampstand, which is the menorah. And I want to talk about the ark and the angels on the ark atonement cover. I put two images here with different depictions, and I thought they were both very interesting of how you could interpret this and I could see either or in, in this fashion so I just wanted to put it on there just to give you some more thought on how it could have been laid out for the two cherubim of gold because it says it's at the two ends of the atonement cover whether that's literally on the ends on the sides or if it's on the ends on the top but uh, you, you see what they did here and the cherubim will be with outspread wings above covering with its wings over the atonement cover and facing each other. The faces of the cherubim will be toward the atonement cover. And then the seven lamps. And I wanted to just point out, we see the temple menorah, which is seven candlesticks. And then you see a, like a Hanukkah menorah, which is nine. And that one is not biblical. That one is just traditional for the Jews. And I just want to show the difference. So when people see a nine and they think it's a temple menorah, now it's strictly for the Hanukkah and used for that tradition. That was more or less what I wanted to show on that. And as you get an idea of what they would look like. But I want to talk about the tabernacle itself, the Holy of Holies. Through Moses was built as above, so below. And when we're looking at the tabernacle here, the Holy of Holies, we see Moses builds this as above, so below, as the pattern from above, and then we'll go into the other temples. Let the Israelites bring to me a contribution. Moses will receive Yahweh's contribution from every man whose heart prompts him. Moses was given a pattern by Yah by which to build it. Three times he is told to follow this pattern. And you see this in Exodus 25, 9, Exodus 25, 40, and 26, 30. And then I'll speak to Acts. The tabernacle of the testimony belonged to our fathers in the wilderness, just as the one who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the design that he had seen. Acts 7.44 Moses was faithful in this. According to the pattern which the Lord had shown Moses, so he made the lampstand. That's Numbers 8.4 And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. Hebrews 3, 5. So what I'm saying here is Moses created the tabernacle from a blueprint or a pattern from above. All right. Now let's go to the tabernacle, Holy of Holies, through Solomon was built as above, so below also. David desired to build a house for Yah, but Yah chose Solomon to build it according to the pattern which he revealed to David. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then David gave to Solomon his son the plan of the vestibule and of its houses, its treasuries, its upper rooms, its inner chambers, and of the house and of the lid of the ark, and the plan of all that he had in mind for the courtyards of the house of Yahweh and for all the surrounding storage rooms. 
the treasuries of the house of God, and the treasuries for sanctified objects. All this I give you in writing. From the hand of Yahweh, he instructed me about all the workings of his plan. So once again, this temple was constructed and made according to the pattern from above. So once again, same with this temple. As above, so below. The tabernacle, Holy of Holies, through Yeshua, was built as above, so below also. The assembly as a whole is the temple of Yah today. The spiritual temple. The assembly is the spiritual temple. All of us. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Yeshua himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built up together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's in Ephesians 2, 20-22. So we see that we all, the assembly, is the whole temple of Yah today, and we're talking spiritually, as above and so below. As the temple of God, we have in common with the tabernacle built by Moses and the temple built by Solomon that we are built according to a pattern. For I have not spoken from myself, but the Father himself who sent me has commanded me what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. The things that I say, just as the Father said to me, thus I say. John twelve forty nine through 50 so Yeshua is telling us, this is the pattern. He's doing what the Father commanded him to do. He's doing what the commandment of eternal life is. He's doing the things that the Father said to him. So as we also are to do what the Father has instructed us to do. The Torah has it written out. Yeshua further explains upon it. So we are to do these things, because these things below are as what is above. We do these things through the Spirit. Further along here is, the individual is the temple of Yah today. The spiritual temple. And that's in John 2.21. This is 1 Peter 2.5-8. And you, yourselves as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua Messiah. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone. We know who that is. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Therefore the honor is for you who believe, but for those who refuse to believe, the stone that the builders rejected... This one has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense who stumble because they disobey the word to which also they were consigned. We see the spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. And when we look that up and understand what the spiritual sacrifices are, according to scripture, that are our deeds of what we are doing if we are walking in obedience, that is sacrifice. Do you not know that you are God's temple and the Spirit of God dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. But you are chosen race. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, so that you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of Yah, the ones who were not shown mercy, but now are shown mercy. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. The one who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of Yah. A pillar in the temple of Yah. 
We're talking, once again, the spiritual house. And he will never go outside again. You'll always be in him. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God and my new name. And this is referring to when the law is written on our hearts. So all of this is put in where we are in the temple of God at this point when the law is written on our hearts. The spiritual holy of holies. Okay, and then lastly I want to touch on the stone tablets. Once again, as above, so below, to live by. We are called living stones. Could this be referring that we are spiritually living with the Torah written on our hearts as in the commandments written on the two stone tablets front and back? The first one is as above, written to express our love to the Creator. The second one is as a below, written to express our love for one another. That's what I wanted to share regarding the stones, regarding as above and so below. Okay, any questions or insights? I just want to say that's beautiful and I really appreciate it. As above, so as below. So I just want to thank you for that, Rob. Thank you. Penny. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to make the connections for people to have a better visual or understanding of the patterns above we are to walk in them and live in them as below and it's very difficult because of this world in which we are in the evil that is just proliferated in it that's why when we are able to do so we are walking through a testing ground so to speak here proving that even in the hardships of a fallen world, we are able to walk in obedience and do our best in that because we love him. And I can only imagine the joy and how Yeshua and Yahweh must be proud of his creation of the people, of the children that can do that, who are faithful, who are persevering. To me, I look at it as like a proud father going, wow, my child, no matter what's thrown at him, he or she's doing really good, man. I'm really proud of them. So that, I hope that's encouraging to people out there. This is Exodus chapter 26. And the tabernacle you will make with ten curtains. You will make them of finely twisted linen and blue and purple and crimson yarns with cherubim, the work of a skilled craftsman. The length of the one curtain will be 28 cubits and the width will be four cubits for the one curtain. One measure will be for all the curtains. Five curtains will be joined to one another and five curtains join to one another, and you will make loops of blue on the edge of the one curtain at the end in the set, and you will do so on the edge of the end curtain in the second set. You will make fifty loops on the one curtain, and you will make fifty loops on the end of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops are to be opposite to one another, and you will make fifty gold clasps and join the curtains to one another with the clasps, so that the tabernacle will be one, and you will make curtains of goat hair for a tent over the tabernacle. You will make them eleven curtains. The length of the one curtain will be thirty cubits, and the width will be four cubits for the one curtain. One measure will be for the eleven curtains, and you will join five curtains together and six curtains together, and you will fold double the sixth curtain at the front of the tent. And you will make 50 loops on the edge of the one curtain at the end of the first set and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain in the second set. And you will make 50 bronze clasps and you will put the clasps in the loops and join the tent so that it will be one. And the surplus in the curtains of the tent will be an overhang. The surplus half curtain will hang over the back of the tabernacle and a cubit from one side and a cubit from the other side in the surplus and the length of the curtains of the tent will be hung over the sides of the tabernacle equally to cover it. And you will make a covering for the tent of red dyed ram skins and a covering of fine leather to go above. And you will make the frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood as uprights. The length of the frame will be ten cubits, and the width of the one frame will be one and a half cubits. You will make two pegs for the one frame for joining each to another, and likewise for all the frames of the tabernacle. And you will make the frames for the tabernacle with twenty frames for the south side. And you will make forty silver bases under the twenty frames, with two bases under the one frame for its two pegs, and two bases under the next frame for its two pegs. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there will be twenty frames, and there are forty silver bases, with two bases under the one frame, and two bases under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle on the west you will make six frames, and you will make two frames for the tabernacle corners at the rear. They will be double at the bottom, and they will be completely together on its top to the one ring. It will be likewise for the two of them. 
They will be for the two quarters, and there will be eight frames in their silver bases, 16 bases, with two bases under the one frame and two bases under the next frame. You will make five bars of acacia wood for the frames on the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames on the second side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames on the side of the tabernacle at the rear on the west. And the bar in the middle, in the midst of the frames, will run from end to end, and you will overlay the frames with gold, and you will make their rings of gold as holders for the bars, and you will overlay the bars with gold, and you will erect the tabernacle according to its plan, which you have been shown on the mountain, and you will make a curtain of blue and purple and crimson yarns and finely twisted linen, the work of a skilled craftsman. He will make it with cherubim, and you will put it on four acacia pillars overlaid with gold with their gold hooks on four silver bases, and you will put the curtain under the clasps, and you will bring the ark of the testimony there inside the curtain, and the curtain will separate for you between the holy and the most holy place. And you will put the atonement cover on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And you will place the table outside the curtain and the lamp stand opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle. And you will put the table on the north side. And you will make for the entrance of the tent a screen of blue and purple and crimson yarns and finely twisted linen. The work of an embroiderer, and you will make for the screen five acacia pillars, and you will overlay them with gold with their gold hooks, and you will cast for them five bronze bases. Before we continue with our insights, I decided to stay on this page just to show you something. What happened with the Dead Sea Scrolls, apparently they took the verses that were that are supposedly on in Exodus chapter 30 and they transposed them also on chapter 26 um, interesting that the Samaritan Pentateuch does the same it relocated the description of the altar of incense from later in Exodus to this chapter it's not a big deal I think it's more like a cosmetic thing or they felt like it was more in context here so that's the main difference that I found between the Dead Sea Scroll transcript and the Masoretic transcript this week yeah nothing changed it was just some yeah verses just, moved around yeah relocated yeah, yeah. For this chapter, I didn't have anything yeah, with yeah. neither one of us, but I did want to point out that we see that the phrase, so that the tabernacle will be one, it talks about the loops and the curtains, and it gives numbers. It gives specific numbers for these things and what to join, and then at each one, it's so that the tabernacle will be one. And then it talks about the frames, the bases, and everything in, in this tabernacle. And I wonder the symbology of the numbers, the things that are connected. Is there some type of connection with the children down here in any sense with us and maybe people with different ranks, positions, and the prophets, the apostles? Everybody has a role and peace to come together to build the temple in that sense. It just made me think mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, and for me, when I read all of this, it's just literally a very detailed engineering or architectural blueprint. It's really interesting. This is Exodus chapter 27. And you will make the altar of acacia wood, five cubits long and five cubits wide. The altar will be square, and its height will be three cubits. And you will make its horns on its four corners. Its horns will be of one piece with it, and you will overlay it with bronze. And you will make its pots for removing its fat soap ashes and its shovels and its sprinkling bowls and its forks and its fire pans. You will make all its equipment with bronze, and you will make for it a grating, a work of bronze network, and you will make on the network four bronze rings on its four ends, and you will put it under the ledge of the altar below, and the network will be up to the middle of the altar, and you will make poles for the altar, poles of acacia wood, and you will overlay them with bronze, and the poles will be put into the rings, and the poles will be on the two sides of the altar when carrying it. You will make it hollow with boards, as it was shown you on the mountain, so they will do. You will make the courtyard of the tabernacle, for the south side will be hangings for the courtyard of finely twisted linen. One hundred cubits long for the one side, and its twenty pillars and their twenty bases will be bronze. The hooks of the pillars and their bands will be silver, and likewise for the north side along the length will be hangings one hundred cubits long, and its twenty pillars and their bases will be bronze. 
The hooks of the pillars and their bands will be silver, and the width of the courtyard for the west side will be hangings of fifty cubits, their ten pillars and their ten bases, and the width of the courtyard for the east side, towards sunrise, will be fifty cubits, and hangings for the shoulder will be fifteen cubits with their three pillars and their three bases, and fifteen cubits of hangings will be for the second shoulder with their three pillars and their three bases, and for the gate of the courtyard there will be a screen of twenty cubits of blue and purple and crimson yarns and finely twisted lid. The work of an embroiderer, with their four pillars and their four bases. All the pillars of the courtyard all round will be banded with silver, and their hooks will be silver, and their bases will be bronze. The length of the courtyard will be 100 cubits, and the width 50 cubits, and the height 5 cubits, of finely twisted linen, with their bronze bases. Bronze will be for all the equipment of the tabernacle in all its service, and all its pegs, and all the pegs of the courtyard. And you will command the Israelites, and they will bring to you pure, beaten olive oil for the light, to cause a lamp to burn continually, in the tent of assembly outside the curtain that is before the testimony. Aaron and his sons will arrange it, from evening until morning, before Yahweh as a lasting statute throughout their generations from the Israelites. Okay, thoughts and insights on chapter 27. All right, let's talk about the tent of assembly, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. Most people will see the imagery of the rectangle within a rectangle, basically. And as you see in the inner picture that's shaded in, that's what most people will see. And then you have another option. And I didn't grab the engineer that came up with this. I know I remember hearing Rob Skiba talk about this with the guy. But when you took just what was written and applied that to what materials was available in the descriptions, not adding or taking away, came up with a circular type of tent and basically fence around that. So I just wanted to show that as another uh -huh. option of what it could look like. I don't know how they could come up with a circle. The Hebrew is very clear that this is a rectangle. He's talking about four sides, east, west, north, and south, and he's giving different length to each side that makes it a rectangle. So I don't think it's, I don't think there is any other way of understanding the description. It has to be a rectangle. Yeah, yeah, that, that, would, that's yeah. The, that is the biggest challenge because it does say side and then the other side. Yeah. And if they're not equal, as in like th this scenario, then no. you, it's open to interpretation one way yeah. and so. But I wanted to and, show that because there are two thoughts out there on that. All right, so in this chapter, something I want to mention is that we heard him say once again, as it was shown to you on the mountain when building the altar. So we know Moshe was up in the mountain for 40 days and he learned a lot. So I want to talk about the pure and beaten olive oil. It was necessary in Exodus 27, 20. And you will command the Israelites... And they will bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. Now let's look at that verse for deeper meanings on this. Luke 12, 35-36. You must be prepared for action and your lamps burning. And you be like people who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast. So that when he comes back and knocks, they can open the door for him immediately. Yes. So prepare for action and your lamps burning. Zephaniah 112, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the uninterested or the uncommitted. Read Zephaniah about that. Literally, Yah's going to be searching Jerusalem with lamps. He's, he's using these figurative words. And he's going to punish those who are uninterested. He didn't say the sinful. He just said the uninterested, the uncommitted. I'm going to tie it in with the ten virgins. Because this is exactly what it's referring to with the ten virgins. They all are waiting for the groom. They all are. But he's going to punish the uncommitted, the mm -hmm. uninterested. They're there because they know. But they're not committed. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven may be compared to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were foolish. They were uncommitted. And five were wise. For when the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take olive oil with them. But the wise ones took olive oil in flasks with their lamps. 
And when the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But in the middle of the night, there was a shout. Behold, the bridegroom come out to meet him. Then all those virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones, the uncommitted ones, said to the wise ones, Give us some of your olive oil because our lamps are going out. But the wise ones answered, saying, Certainly, there will never be enough for us and for you. There will never be enough for us and for you. Go instead to those who sell olive oil and buy some for yourselves. Very interesting. But while they have gone away to buy it, the bridegroom arrived and those who were ready went inside with him to the wedding celebration and the door was shut. And later, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, open the door for us. But he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, be on the alert, because you do not know the day or the hour. I hope that made some sense to you regarding the lamps, because the Israelites were commanded to go and bring in oil for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. So this wasn't like they all went out, got one flask, brought it in, and they were done. No, because they had to continually keep that lamp burning. They were always bringing in oil. Mm -hmm. They had to be prepared. They had to plan. They had to be ready to do that on a regular basis and not have your lamp and just enough oil for the day and, and not caring about the future or what's coming around the corner. Further, regarding the Israelites bringing the pure beaten olive oil for the light. 1 Corinthians 6.20 for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. If you were bought with a price and your master instructs you to live righteously, you will do so in obedience, proving your loyalty and your love. We are called to bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. You produce pure oil only when the fruit, which is olives, olives is a fruit, is beaten, crushed, and filtered. Mm -hmm. That's how you get pure oil, when it's beaten, crushed, and filtered. Our expectation should be walking in the fruits of the Spirit and enduring to the end, seeking His face. This way, we have the pure oil and extra always with us. We were bought with a price. They were told to go out and buy their own oil. So now they had to go out. They had to do what they should have done before, but they were too late. They weren't committed. They were lukewarm, and the results are the results. Mm -hmm. So I hope that encourages everyone to continue to walk in obedience, to produce fruits of the Spirit, and know that the oil only comes when it's beaten, crushed, and filtered. So when we are being tested, when we are being tried, when it is very difficult in our lives and we're persevering and we're still praising Yah, that's where we produce the oil. And that oil will light our lamps for a long time as we continue to walk in that obedience. Mm, praise Yah. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the tabernacle of Yahweh. I put a diagram here. And I showed how the, the location of the tent of meeting within the camp in the wilderness and how the tribes were arranged around the, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. So the tabernacle or Mishkan in Hebrew, first mentioned in Exodus 25, was the portable sanctuary that the Israelites carried with them in the wilderness. Mishkan comes from the Hebrew root meaning to dwell. The tabernacle was considered to be the earthly dwelling place of Yah. In Exodus 25, 8 through 9, God instructs Moses to tell the Israelites to build a mikdash, a sanctuary, where God may dwell, specifying exactly how the tabernacle should be designed. It was used from a year after they crossed the Sea of Fried. I, I prefer to call it Sea of Fried rather than Red Sea, because that term does not exist in the Bible. 
until King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem. So for a period of 400 years, they used the tabernacle. References to the tabernacle in the Bible are plenty, and I listed all of them. You can read about it in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles, Psalms, Acts, Hebrews, and Revelation. The 19th century Jewish commentator known as Malbim provided a symbolic explanation for the relevance of the tabernacle. It was not that God needed a physical sanctuary on earth, but that each one of us is called to build a tabernacle for God in our hearts, preparing ourselves to become a sanctuary for God. The book of Exodus goes into elaborate detail to describe the design and construction of the tabernacle, which was a tent-like structure covered with 10 strips of linen cloth. The cloth was to be made of blue, purple, and crimson yarn with the cherubim motif from the R cover carrying here. The text goes on to detail the exact number of loops and gold clubs by which each cloth should be tied to the next. It adds that 11 clothes of goat hair should cover the tabernacle connected by loops and copper clasps. Farther, ram skins and I bet, I bet Apple corrected the word that they put here. <laughs> it's ram skin and, and goat skins were to be used as farther covering for the tabernacle. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, the tabernacle was surrounded by a rectangular fence with a gate which enclosed an outer courtyard area. An altar for burned offerings stood in the courtyard. Deeper into the courtyard, a screened section of the holy place from the rest of the area. Even deeper, a curtain created a barrier to the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. This innermost and most holy area of the tabernacle was designated to house the Ark of the Covenant, the place where the tablets of the law would be stored. The Ark was to be made of acacia wood and overlaid with pure gold. Yah provides precise measurements for building the Ark, two and a half cubit long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Acacia poles overlaid with gold were used for carrying the ark through the desert. A cover for the ark was required with decorations of two gold cherubim, one on each side, facing each other with outspread wings. Additional instructions include the production of ritual items, a table, bowls, ladles, jars, and jugs and an intricately designed six-branched menorah or candelabra. The outer court of the tabernacle as viewed by someone approaching it would appear as a privacy fence almost 73 feet wide by about 146 feet long by 7.3 feet high, made of fine, when the Bible says fine, it means high thread count per inch, okay? So made of fine white linen support, supported by bronze posts, 20 on the long side and 10 on the short side, with bronze bases and silver cups on top. Also, there were silver hooks on the post for attaching the linen and prostates for cords that to support the post on both sides. This white fence was seen with a cloud of smoke rising from the center of it in the midst of the many dark tents of the children of Israel who were camped around it. What a remarkable contrast. The tabernacle was considered to be the place where Yah's presence dwelled among the Israelites where the divine and the earthly realms met. The tabernacle's design physically represented a gradual increase in gradations of holiness from the outer courtyard meant to create a barrier from the profane realm 
to the Holy of Holies only entered once a year on Yom Kippur by the high priest. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to share with you a series of short videos that give a 3D a simulation of what we just heard described in detail in the last three chapters. So let me start it. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle for the south side southward. There shall be hangings for the court of fine twined linen of an hundred cubits long for one side, and the twenty pillars thereof, and their twenty sockets shall be of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. And likewise for the north side in length, there shall be hangings of an hundred cubits long, and his twenty pillars and their twenty sockets of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. And for the breadth of the court on the west side shall be hangings of fifty cubits, their pillars ten, and their sockets ten. And the breadth of the court on the east side eastward shall be fifty cubits, the hangings of one side of the gate shall be fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And on the other side shall be hangings fifteen cubits, their pillars three, and their sockets three. And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of twenty cubits, of blue and purple and scarlet, and fine twined linen, wrought with needlework. And their pillars shall be four, and their sockets four. All the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver, their hooks shall be of silver, and their sockets of brass. And the length of the court shall be an hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen, and their sockets of brass, all the vessels of the tabernacle in all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the pins of the court shall be of brass. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his firepans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass. And upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof. And thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, as it was showed thee in the mount, so shall they make it. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and thou shalt put water therein. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not, and it shall be a statute for ever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. 
and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of an handbreadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for the places of the staves, to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all, of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs and his flowers shall be of the same, and six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side, three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knob and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knob and a flower, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knobs and their flowers. And there shall be a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knobs and their branches shall be of the same, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it, with all these vessels. And look that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon, of shittim wood shalt thou make it. A cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof. Four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof. The horns thereof shall be of the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown of gold round about. And two golden rings shalt thou make to it under the crown of it, by the two corners thereof. Upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it, and they shall be for places for the staves to bear it withal. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn incense upon it. And when Aaron lighteth the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall you pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year, with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shalt make upon it a crown of gold round about. 
and thou shalt cast four rings of gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings in the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The stave shall be in the rings of the ark, they shall not be taken from it. And thou shalt put into the ark the testimony, which I shall give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold. Of beaten work shalt thou make them, in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherub on the one end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee, in commandment unto the children of Israel. Okay, we are back to our presentation. So I included the link to this series of videos and, and some credits here to the person that produced and narrated it. it it's such a beautiful visualization. Helping. It helps those of us who are not engineers and cannot visualize what we read, really visualize the magnificence of this structure just a couple of comments. First of all, whenever in English brass, actually in Hebrew it's copper. I don't know if it makes a difference, but it is copper, okay? So we have a lot of conduit metals going conductive, on, yeah. conductive metal going on here, uh, copper and gold. The thoughts that I had when I was looking at it is how magnificent everything is and how everything is meticulously designed with the finest possible materials. But most of this beauty and richness is inside. It's hidden inside underneath a very non-pretentious cover, linen, basically linen and gold skins. skins okay. Yeah. So from the outside, it looks like, okay, linen and gold skins, but inside, you find all of this richness and craftsmanship that is just divine craftsmanship with all of these precious metals. And I'm thinking if we are a representation of the temple, then that's how we are supposed to be also outside, non-pretentious, simple, basic, no adornment, but inside is where the treasure, uh, the treasure is, yeah. inside us, okay? Anyway, those are the thoughts that I had on this one, so now I'll just Thanks continue. for sharing the video, that was nice. Yeah, that, I, that was I really good. loved it. Okay, so now I want to just touch on the tabernacle was used for about 400 years, and, and most of its time it actually spent in Shiloh, and if you remember... Back in week four of this series, I did a deep dive and I went on a rabbit uh, trail to tell you, to present my theory that Salem, who so many people believe is Jerusalem, is actually not Jerusalem. Salem is actually Shiloh. Okay, so the tabernacle stands as a symbol of the paradox of divine presence in the world. On the one hand, Yah is believed to be everywhere, or perhaps as the Malbim argues in human hearts. But on the other hand, the tabernacle and later in the temple in Jerusalem represents a physical location where humans can experience a connection with Yah. 
and here I just shared about Israel's first capital which was Shiloh and it was actually in the area of Samaria and that's maybe that's why the letter the Pharisees didn't like it and it, they decided that Shiloh is Salem and Jerusalem. So according to the book of Joshua, the Israelites within their first years of entering the promised land assembled in Shiloh on at least six separate occasions. No other city is listed as a national assembly point. Furthermore, Joshua 18.1 says that the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, was set up in Shiloh. This points to its use as Israel's first capital city. Archaeological evidence from Tel Shiloh indicates that the city was a religious center during the time of Joshua. Archaeologists have found sacrificial animal bones, deposits, and Celtic vessels dating to this time, while a few archaeologists, such as Professor Finkelstein, interpret these finds as Canaanite, most agree there are evidence of notable religious activity in Shiloh. By the way, those bone deposits, the animal bone deposits, were all clean animals, which Canaanite didn't use clean animals in their sacrifices. So this indicates the tabernacle once rested there as the Bible claims. Besides archaeology, other factors suggest Shiloh was an excellent location for a capital city. It was located near a fertile valley capable of growing enough food for the city's inhabitants. The city and surrounding farmlands had access to dependable water sources. In addition, the mound or tail on which the city was built had steep slopes on three sides, making it easier to defend. Super interesting, Shiloh had the perfect acoustic conditions for ma mass communication. In the 1970s, sound engineer Ma Mark Miles conducted acoustic tests at Shiloh. According to his results, the ambient noise level of Shiloh was far below the ideal noise requirements of the best concert hall. Miles said it was the quietest spot he had ever measured, quiet enough to hear a human voice clearly at a distance of over 500 meters. <laughs> okay, that's uh, 1,500 feet. Something about the landscape and surroundings at Shiloh makes it possible for some to travel extraordinarily far. The Bible records instances of a single speaker, such as Joshua, addressing thousands of people in Shiloh. This kind of mass communication would only have been possible in a few acoustically appropriate locations. Shiloh was one of those locations. Shiloh is only mentioned four times in the book of Judges, but these few references are enough to prove that a few people still look to it as the capital of Israel. Judges 18.31 says that the house of God, or tabernacle, was still in Shiloh. Israel still used it as an assembly point in Judges 21.12, and an annual feast period perhaps the Feast of the Tabernacle commanded in Leviticus 23 was kept there according to Judges 21-21. And I included the link for a very interesting article about Shiloh, so you're welcome to follow it. This is a, a, a drawing based on the archaeological finds of what they are estimating the mapping of Shiloh was and again you will have to download it and look at it closely and you can see where the tabernacle was and I included more links here to more interesting articles. This is Exodus chapter 28 and bring near to you Aaron your brother and his sons with him from the midst of the Israelites to serve as priests for me Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar the sons of Aaron and you will make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for splendor. And you will speak to all the skilled of heart, whom I have given a gift of skill. And they will make the garments of Aaron to consecrate him for his serving as my priest. And these are the garments that they will make, a breast piece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of specially woven fabric, a turban and a sash. And they will make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and for his sons to serve as priests for me. 
and they will take the gold and the blue and the purple and the crimson yarns and the fine linen, and they will make the ephod of gold, blue and purple, and crimson yarns, and finely twisted linen, the work of a skilled craftsman. It will have two joining shoulder pieces at its two edges, so that it can be fastened, and the waistband of his ephod, which is on it, will be of like work to it, gold, blue, and purple, and crimson yarns, and finely twisted linen. And you will take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the Israelites, with six of their names on the one stone and the remaining six on the second, according to their genealogies, as the work of a skilled stone craftsman. With seal engravings you will engrave on the two stones the names of the Israelites. You will make them mounted in gold filigree settings, and you will set the two stones on the ephod's shoulder pieces as stones of remembrance for the Israelites. And Aaron will bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulder pieces for remembrance. And you will make gold filigree settings, and you will make two braided chains of pure gold ornamental cord work, and you will put the chains of the ornamental cords on the filigree settings, and you will make a breast piece of judgment, a work of a skilled craftsman. You will make it like the work of the ephod. You will make it of gold, blue and purple and crimson yarns, and finely twisted linen. It will be square, doubled, a span its length and a span its width. And you will fill it with stone mounting, four rows of stone, a row of carnelian, topaz, an emerald is the first row, and the second row is a malachite, a sapphire, and a moonstone, and the third row is a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row is a turquoise, and an onyx, and a jasper. Their settings will be woven with gold. The stones will be according to the names of the Israelites, twelve according to their names, with seal engravings. Each according to its name they will be for the twelve tribes. And you will make on the breastpiece braided chains, a work of pure gold ornamental cord. And you will make on the breastpiece two gold rings, and you will put the two rings on the two edges of the breastpiece. And you will put the two gold ornamental cords on the two rings on the edges of the breastpiece. And you will put the two ends of the two ornamental cords on the two filigree settings. And you will put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod at the front of it. And you will make two gold rings, and you will place them on the two ends of the breastpiece, on its edge that is on the other side of the ephod, to the inside. And you will make two rings and put them on the two shoulder pieces of the ephod below at its front near its seam above the waistband of the ephod. And they will tie the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord to be on the waistband of the ephod. And the breastpiece will not come loose from the ephod. And Aaron will bear the names of the Israelites in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart. When he comes to the sanctuary, for a remembrance before Yahweh continually, and you will put the Urim and the Thummim on the breastpiece of judgment, and they will be on the heart of Aaron when he comes before Yahweh. And Aaron will bear the judgment of the Israelites on his heart before Yahweh continually, and you will make the robe of the ephah totally of blue yarn, and the opening for his head will be in the middle of it. Its opening will have an edge all round, the work of a weaver. It will be like the opening of a sturdy garment for it, so that it will not be torn. And you will make on its hem pomegranates of blue and purple and crimson yarns on its hem all round and bells of gold in the midst of them all round. A gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all round. And it will be on Aaron for serving, and its sound will be heard at his coming into the sanctuary before Yahweh and at his going out, so that he will not die. And you will make a pure gold rosette, and you will engrave on it with seal engravings, a holy object for Yahweh. And you will place it on a blue cord, and it will be on the turban, at the front of the turban it will be, and it will be on the forehead of Aaron, and Aaron will bear the guilt of the holy objects that the Israelites will consecrate for all their holy gifts, and it will be on his forehead continually for acceptance for them before Yahweh. And you will weave the tunic of fine linen, and you will make a turban of fine linen, and you will make a sash, the work of an embroiderer. And for the sons of Aaron you will make tunics, and you will make for them sashes and headdresses. You will make them for glory and for splendor, and you will clothe them, Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, and you will anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them. And they will serve as priests for me, and make for them undergarments of linen to cover naked flesh. They will be from loins to thigh, and they will be on Aaron and on his sons when they come to the tent of assembly, or when they approach the altar to serve in the sanctuary, so that they will not bear guilt and die. It is a lasting statute for him and for his offspring after him. Thoughts and insights on chapter 28. So, vestments of splendor. We just went through three chapters giving us a very detailed and meticulous blueprint for the tabernacle and its surrounding. And in this chapter, we get a very meticulous blueprint for the high priest garments and also for the, the other priest. So I just wanted to touch on the high priest garments. 
So many passages in scriptures refer to clothing as a symbol. In Psalms 132.9, let your priests clothe themselves with righteousness and let your faithful sing with joy. Job 29.14, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a headband. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, in the same way, younger men, be subject to the elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Ephesians 6, 11, 13 through 15 and 17. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the stratagems of the devil because our struggle is not against blood and flesh but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because of this, take up the full armor of God in order that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand. Stand therefore, girding your waist with truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness and by binding shoes under your feet with the preparation of the good news of peace. And receive the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. And in Isaiah 11:5, and righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, mm. and faithfulness the belt around his loins. Yah told Moses to make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for splendor. Exodus 28:2. The clothes of Aaron would certainly blow, be glorious and beautiful. There were eight garments which were called vestments of sanctity. The Hebrew word for sanctity comes from the word holy, which is kadosh. Therefore, these garments were only used in the service of the temple and at no other time. We also see this with the utensil used in the temple. In fact, everything associated with the temple was considered holy and was to be handled in a special way. These garments were called garments of glory. The Hebrew word for glory comes from the root word which has the meaning heavy, kavod, as in full, like the fullness of the Lord. The garments were a picture of the dignity and beauty connected with serving God. Yeah. I just want to point out the connection you have here in these scriptures in Ephesians verse 14. Stand therefore girding your waist with truth. And then Isaiah 11 5, he defines that further. What is truth? Righteousness shall be the belt around your waist and faithfulness the belt around your loins. So truth is righteousness and faithfulness tied into those two together when you compare them. Okay. Four of the priestly garments are worn exclusively by the high priest. They alone are called Big Day Akodesh, the holy garments. Moses first places them upon Aaron at the consecration of the priest, Leviticus 8, 7, and 9. Aaron wears them until his death, transferring them to his son and successor, El Azar. Immediately before he dies, number 20, 25 through 28, all successive high priests are commanded to wear them as well in Exodus and Leviticus. So Leviticus 8, 6 through 9. So Moses brought Aaron and his sons near and he washed them with water. Then he put the tunic on him and tied the sash around him. Then he clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him. Then he tied the ephod's waistband around him and fastened the ephod to him with it. Then he placed the breastpiece on him and put the urim and the tumim into the, the breastpiece. And he placed the turban on his head and on the front of the turban he placed the gold trosset, the holy diadem, just as Yahweh had commanded Moses. The fact that the garments are included in the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and its furnishings and in the account of their manufacture 
indicates that they were not thought of as items belonging to the priest, but rather as sacred equipment appertaining to the tabernacle and only used there. Indeed, they are explicitly designated for use, le chalet bakodesh, okay, used in when serving in the sanctuary. The list of materials needed for the sanctuary includes the precious stones required for the ephod and breastplate. Further, the fabric portions of the garments were made of the same materials and fashioned in the same manner as the fabrics in the tabernacle itself with those used to make the high priest garments identical to those used in the most sacred section of the tabernacle. The four garments peculiar to the high priest are unlike any normal articles of clothing. Their shape and design show that they are not intended to provide protection from the elements or to fulfill the requirements of modesty. In addition to fabrics, they contain gold and precious stones. On three of them, words are inscribed. Their weight and the manner in which they are placed on the high priest's body render them neither practical nor comfortable. The high priest is said to wear them only when he enters the sanctuary interior, which he is commanded to do twice daily, morning and evening. Most important, each one of the high priest garment is said to function in a specific way whenever the high priest enters the sanctuary wearing it. Let's look at them. First of all, we have the ephod. The ephod's precious stones inscribed with the names of the 12 tribes are said to serve as avnei zikaron, stones of remembrance or stones of memorial, and I talked about it, about it last week, to remind Yah of Israel, and the same is true of the 12 stones on the breastplate, thus by his very person, which we might call the body politics, the high priest personifies the whole of the Israelite people before Yahweh, i.e. when standing in Yah's presence. That's in Exodus 28, 12, 29, and then 39, 7. The breastplate or Hoshen, the breastplate was called the breastplate of judgment. The breastplate was a rectangular plate with jewels hanging from gold chains. Its purpose? The high priest was considered the mediator between Yah and the people. He was to bring the sanctity, glory, and splendor of Yah to the people, and he was to bring the sinful man to Yah. The breastplate was worn over the heart. The breastplate was set with four rows of small square stones each row containing three stones. The first row was, again, this is the English assumption. Really, no one knows what most of those stones meant, okay, those names. So Sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. Actually, in Hebrew, it says diamond. The second row was an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row was a liquor and agate and an amethyst. The fourth row was a burial and onyx and a jasper. These beautiful stones had the names of Israel engraved on them. When Aaron entered into the presence of Yah, these precious beautiful stones were a memorial and testimony to Yah of his love for his people. These same stones will be used in the New Jerusalem, which is described in Revelation 21. The breastplate, along with its pouch, contained the urim, which literally means lights, and tumim, which literally means perfections. If the stones are a picture of the high priest representing us before Yah, the urim and tumim is a picture of the high priest representing Yah to us. Urim and tumim were two stones used as a means by which Yah's judgment might be made known. Their meaning is light and perfection after the days of David. We no longer read about them. Those stones are quite the mystery.
Next we have the robe, Me'il Ha'efod. This next piece of clothing is called the robe of the ephod. It was the robe that the ephod was worn over. It was completely blue. The robe was quite unique with its bells and pomegranates on the hem. The bells were the, for the purpose that the people could hear them and know that the high priest would, was ministering before Yah. This way the people could pray and repent as he was officiating in their name. Also, they would know that he was not struck dead by Yah, but that Yah was receiving his offering. Jewish sages interpret the priestly garments this way. As sacrifices make atonement, so do the priestly vestments make atonement. The coat atoned for bloodshed, the breeches for lewdness. The head covering for arrogance, the girdle for impure meditations of the heart, the breastplate for neglect of civil laws, the effort for idolatry, the headpiece for brazenness, and the robe for slander. In addition, a pomegranate contains 613 seeds. That's what they say, I never counted them representing the 613 commandments of Torah. Thus, this is a picture of the high priest carrying a constant reminder of the Torah on his clothing. From this, it seems that the rabbis consider the actual vestments worn by the high priest on Yom Kippur to be in some way involved with making atonement. The next piece is the headpiece or crown was made of solid gold and upon the headpiece it was written a holy object for Yahweh. It is said to remove from Yah's abode any wrongdoing connected with Israel's offering and to ensure by means of the inscription proclaiming that Israel's worship a holy object for Yahweh that Yah graciously accept their sacrifices. The next piece is the tunic, ketonet. Not much is said about the tunic except and you will weave the tunic of fine linen. The tunic was made of white linen. The word used here for linen is shesh, which literally means six. This means that the thread used in this garment was a six-ply linen thread. It was worn closest to the body and it represented purity. Next we have the head covering, the mitznefet. There were two different types of head coverings. The priest wore one type, the priest wore one type of which Josephus tried it. It was a flattish cap of woven linen that was wrapped repeatedly around part of the head like a turban and then it hung down on the back. The high priest wore a beautiful one turban around his full head and it then hung down on his back and the gold head piece was placed upon it. The covering of the head represented submission. It symbolized humility before Yah. Because the entire priesthood wore some sort of covering on their heads, this is why Jews wear a covering on their heads even till today. Then the next piece is the breeches, Michnasei Bal. The breeches were like pants. They went from the hip to the thigh. Um, some commentaries refer to them as pants. Others call them underwear. Nevertheless, the reason for them was for modesty. It was to cover up any potential nakedness when the priest would ascend to the altar. And the last piece called Avnet, the sash or the girdle. The sash was of fine linen with embroidered work in blue, purple, and scarlet. Those worn by the priest were of white twined linen. The sash should not be confused with the embroidered belt of the ephod. Like the other priestly vestment, the purpose of the sash was for glory and for beauty. On the Day of Atonement, the high priest changed into special linen garments that included a sash of fine linen without any embroidery. That's in Leviticus 16.4. These linen garments were worn only once with new ones being made each year. So 
Yah referred to the priest's garment not only as garments of sanctity and garments of glory, but garments of splendor. Splendor could be translated as beauty. These garments added beauty to the sanctuary. These garments had the finest embroidery and stitch work, detailed weaving and handiwork. But what also added to the beauty were the colors of the sanctuary were the same colors of the priestly garments. And I just want to touch upon each color before I conclude. So gold. Gold is the purest metal and is often used in connection with royalty. This showed that the priesthood was a royal priesthood. This precious metal is first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 2 in the description of the Garden of Eden. There are a total of 362 references to it in the Bible. In Genesis 2, 8 through 14, and Yahweh God planted a garden of Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And Yahweh God caused to grow from the ground every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, along with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flowed out from Eden that watered the garden, and from there it diverged and became four branches. The name of the first is the Pishon. It went around all the land of Havila where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Crystal and onyx stones are there. So this is the first time we hear about gold, crystal, and onyx actually in Genesis 2. Blue. The sky blue color in Hebrew is called trelet. Blue was to represent heaven. It is also the same color as the tzitzi, the cords which are worn on the four corners of the garments. The priest robe was made of this blue. Like the tzitzit, it is a reminder to follow Torah. The priest robe was like one big tzitzit to remind the people to follow Torah. Now, this blue was made from the blood of the Chilazon. The Chilazon was a Mediterranean snail. It was very rare. It took 12,000 snails to produce 1.4 grams of dye. Okay, it's called Tolat Shani. This color is first mentioned in the Bible in Exodus 25, in this week portion. Out of 49 references to it, 43 refer to the tabernacle, temple, and the garments of the high priest. The remaining six references are all to do with royalty and special status. Scarlet. Scarlet is a color to remind us of our human nature. The high priest then represented mankind. The crimson color was produced by a worm called the crimson worm. The crimson red was called Tolata Shani. I'm sorry, I, the previous the trellet was from the Chilazon and this one is Tolata Shani. This color is first mentioned in the Bible in Exodus 25. There are six references to it and all are related to the tabernacle and the garments of the high priest. That's Tolata Shani, scarlet. Purple was a combination of the blue and scarlet. Again, because of the difficulty in making this color, it was a sign of royalty. This dark red color, which resembled purple, was called Argaman. This color is first mentioned in the Bible in Exodus 25. Out of the 38 references to it, 28 refer to the tabernacle and the garments of the high priest. The remaining 10 references are all to do with royalty and special status. And then the last color is white. It represents purity. It's on this basis that we come to Yah. I want to mention on robes that the robes of righteousness, I believe, would be blue. If we're looking at this pattern, what blue represents the Torah and obedience. Yeah. Where white is purity and that... that means something slightly different as, as far as that goes. So that aspect of, if it doesn't say white robes, like when it talks in like maybe Revelation where the saints wear on white robes, if it just says robes of righteousness, I would, I would bet you they were blue. They were blue. <laughs>
Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and lastly, I put this up and one of my thoughts on this was the armor of God mentioned in Ephesians. To me, when you read it, it sounds like it's being based upon the Roman armor type of style when I think you can really look at this and tie it into garment because we know the priests went to war too. Mm -hmm. They were... The Levites. Yeah, the Levites. Mm -hmm. And we tie that in. That's more or less what, what we're looking at. Because it says, put on the full armor of God. And this is in Ephesians 6, 11 through 17. I know you already read this, but I, I just want to highlight the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the stratagems of the devil, his tricks, his de deception, etc. Because our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Because of this, take up the full armor of God in order that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand therefore, girding your waist with truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness and binding shoes under the feet with the preparation of good news of peace. And I know the translation says shoes, but when you look at the Greek, it really doesn't say shoes. It just says, oh God, what did it say? It was referring to more or less your feet in peace. So I found that interesting, and I was going to put that translation on there, but I just left this one on there. So it didn't necessarily say shoes. Here we see the priest is barefoot, so I thought that tied in, in peace. And everything taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And we can look at the shield of faith being either the ephod or the robe of righteousness. And receive the helmet of salvation, and we saw the mitre and the turban, what that represented. And the sword of the spirit, which is, it's not a sword, but it's, a, it's the word of God. I, I was reading this, I thought, hey, this fits in with what the priestly garments yeah, that's what I thought that are. Yeah, so. more so than this mm -hmm. Roman armor depiction yeah. in, in my mind. So, I so I wanted to share that and, and, and have people think about that and hope it was a blessing to everyone. Okay, so any questions or insights or thoughts on chapter 28? I just love that last part about the, the ring, the, the priestly garment, when comparing it with what happened with the seizures and it being a Roman parent or soldier. And we're not. That's, I always didn't think that sounded right. And I felt, no, we're Hebrews. We're not Roman soldiers. Yes, the, the Hebrews did battle, but the comparing it, I love that you did that, Rob, comparing it with the priestly garment and having it side by side and showing us that's not what we are to, to wear the priestly garments. That's what kind of armor we're to put on, that armor of the ring. So thank you for doing this. It was awesome. I love the study, by the way. I was trying to stay focused, but my husband called me. So I was uh -uh. <laughs> like, oh, that's okay. I'll have to re-listen to this again. It's great. <laughs> thank you. No so listening to Pam, I'm realizing that whenever I read Ephesians, I always assume that he's talking about the high priest clothing. So I guess you on the uh, Christian most Christian record? teaching is yeah, yeah this oh, the one really? on the right yeah the one oh, on the right wow yeah. wow I never exactly okay exactly. For, for me yeah. it was like for sure it's the high priest that's why I included it when I started my deep dive because wow so that's a new thing for me I didn't realize that they were well, okay you being you being a Israelite Hebrew, being born in Israel, you would automatically go to the high priest's garment. Yeah. But as a, if someone being raised in a Christian church, we wow. don't, our mindset was always the Roman soldier outfit. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Beautiful. So we all connected a lot of that here. Yeah. yeah. And I could have went deeper on this. Like I said, regarding like the, this translation of the shoes, it, it yeah. doesn't say that in the Greek. And so that tells you it's just feet so that ties in with the hebrew israelite priest having bare feet and i i just didn't have the time to dissect it but i i wanted to show it because i truly believe that when it's talking about this full armor of god it is the priestly garments and they all represent righteousness and 
truth and peace and faith and salvation and the word of Yah, that is how we are to operate in a priestly manner, not necessarily as a soldier. Yeah, soldier. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Okay, okay, so looking at the incense, we've got that the lay and that's not the labor it's the holder but for the incense and the chain okay we know that the incense is symbolic of the prayers yeah, you know, uh, yeah. going up to father the sweet aroma of the prayers of the believers so i'm like looking at it and thinking okay what part of it would be the we always think the word was the sword because the roman soldier carries that sword all my entire life until i started following torah and keeping Fathers trying my best to follow what commandments would apply to me and trying to follow Father's feasts and everything just the last four years. Like I said, being raised, I became a Christian at 16, so 50 years ago. In my mind, it always went to the Roman soldier's outfit. But what would represent, you said the robe, the actual blue robe or the ephod. Isn't the ephod the breastplate of righteousness then on the priest? Yeah, so if you look at this, yeah, if you look at this image, the 12 stones is the breastplate and then the okay. the tunic or the apron, I guess you would say in this, oh, this picture, apron, yeah. that's the ephod. Then you have the blue robe oh, underneath the ephod. Because the, the ephod, and something else interesting about the ephod is it has the scarlet, it has the blue, it has the red, purple, red? and yeah. it also has gold threading throughout it too. Threading, wow. I can't even imagine how gorgeous this whole this whole outfit. Is yeah, so exactly. With all those stones. Yeah. And with the gold filigree being embroidered in there. Yes. I, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's the ephod is the apron part. I don't know why I thought the ephod was the 12 stones that, that you know, with the... Earth. No, that's the Hoshen. That's the Hoshen. The price plate is where you have the stones. Twelve stones. Yeah. Yeah. That's the Hoshen. That's how you say it in Hebrew. Just, Can you mention how heavy? How heavy would that bread? I know. That's what I thought. I was like, because in addition to this, he had two more stones on his on each one on each shoulder, and then he had the Urim and Tumim. So that's a lot of weight to carry. Oh, oh and then the gold okay. the diadem. Oh, okay, so the stones on his shoulders are not the unum and thur them, or how do you say that? Oh, no, no, those are the onyx stones. Oh. Yeah. Oh, so those good. were the onyx. Okay, so where on the breastplate or is the, how do you say it? They or even to me, they are hidden. You cannot see them. Oh. Yeah, oh, they are oh, hidden. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. And then there were like the gold chains or whatever to put the breastplate on them. Wasn't that connected to? What was the, yeah, I wonder what the back part, what did the back part look like? I'm curious. Maybe there was the back part. I don't know. Yeah, uh, there might have been some kind of counterweight on the back too, but the chains go from the top of the breastplate up to those, I think, up to the stones and around and to the back connected somehow. Yeah, it doesn't specifically say. Yeah. I did want to mention that when you look at each one of these, what fits in with the garments of the priest, and when you get down to the Word of God, where it says the sword of the Spirit. Now, sword, obviously we think of a sword, but we always know the sword is always referenced in Revelation and John about, about the Word. Exactly. The and word this is God. the sword of the Spirit. So this is the Word of the Spirit, Word of God. And that would simply be just Him speaking the Word of God. Yes. We are armed with that. And that's why we are studying it day and night as it yeah. says we're we have it on our hearts we're we're following it we're walking in faithfulness and then we can share it and not just with words but with our actions mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's one of well, the most beautiful passages in the Bible. Yeah. sorry Renee, i didn't mean to stomp on you mm -hmm. that's very good yeah Good. Yeah, I, I was looking for the same type of 3D videos that I found on the tabernacle, which I thought was amazing. That was a great video. It was yeah. amazing because it brought into visualization what we read about. I was looking yeah. for something like this on the high priest uh, garments, but I couldn't right. find it. I want to say that those videos are amazing. They yeah. are so Great and Stuart and to the point and yes. that's just visually. They were yes. excellent. Yeah. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Is that what Yeshua looks like right now, what he's wearing? I wonder. As above, so below. 
Yeah. That's a big question, Gilroy. I think that is what he'd be wearing. He's our high priest up there. Yeah, so, and his bare foot and his feet are like brass. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, he said mm -hmm. that it mm -hmm. cold in the midst of the menorah. Why, why is Good it the That's how it is. But mm -hmm. brass, uh, hey. brass is but, different than copper, right? Yeah, brass is, a, a, I think, a mixture. It's a mixture. Copper is more pure, and in Hebrew, it's all nechotshet, it's all uh, copper, and I don't know why they keep uh, translating it as brass. Brass is not pure, it, um, it's a mixture. Yeah, yeah brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. I yeah. can't believe that does that with the translations, because we kept boring in our studies on another discard server. What is, what, we know brass is a mixture, brands, translations were doing brass and brands. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When yeah. you say copper, I was like, oh my goodness, that is because copper is very conductive. What exactly. you say, it can conduct electricity. Yeah. Copper, gold, silver, the pure, they conduct. Yeah. Gold yeah. is a superconductor, so it's copper. Yeah. Exactly. But that makes so much difference. Yes. And silver, is, silver is the best conductor than copper then gold. Gold is used in electronics because it doesn't corrode. Mm -hmm. But silver is really good contact or uh, conductor because of the equal amount of electrons or protons. And it's funny how looking at the tabernacle, yes, they have their hooks that are silver and they're attached to copper. Copper, uh, yes. That's going to be ground is ground mm -hmm. rods. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm thinking of the caps. The caps on the pills and the pence and the linen. That's silver, right? And then yeah. the bottom was the cup, yeah. right? Yeah, the, the energy inside that structure mm. was probably phenomenal because all of those metals were conducting energy. And, and remember, Think of that almost like a power plant, you could say. They set it up and it was all this, this energy and power. And I wonder, because remember, we, we, we read where it says, none of their shoes wore out, none of their clothing yes. wore out. So <laughs> this was rejuvenating and energizing them and their materials. Yes. And we know that linen and, and the pure mm -hmm. fabrics are very conductive and frequency of healing ways. Yep. Yes. So this would be, like you said, this would make their linen and their healing their bodies and rejuvenating the garments with the frequencies. That is so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That may get yeah, really good, you guys. Really good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm thinking about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Rest watch me. Yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of information there. Yeah. I, I sometimes I really get uh, bothered by translation, and copper is one of them. I have no idea why they would change it everywhere. Like every yeah. translation changed it. Yeah, unfortunately, due to all the copyrights and so forth, when there's a quote, a new Bible coming out and they have to change a, a percentage of the words so it doesn't match as other Bibles, etc., we lose so much. It's One translation has a, a really accurate one and then most of the others do not. And then maybe you find most of them have an accurate one and then the one that you liked doesn't have a good one. Yeah. And it's like that. And that's, it's very tough because when you're studying it, you almost literally have to read it in the Hebrew. And even if you read it in <laughs> Hebrew and you're not familiar with the Hebrew and you're using Strong's and Thayer's and all of these concordances and dictionaries that not all the time do they even get them 100% right. There's none that are 100% right. It, it, it's, mm -hmm. And I find that, and it's just like, wow, you really got to dig into this to, to dig out some good stuff. You get the essentials, but digging into it, you find out much deeper things. And I like that when we do this every week, we pick up something that's on our heart, and we dig a little deeper into it and show a few little things here and there. But there is so much... And the translations, I wish we all spoke Hebrew, knew exactly what every word meant, and could just read the, he the Hebrews mm -hmm. straight and not have any of this confusion. I just wanted to share the text variants between the versions. I couldn't find any variants between the Masoretic and 
uh, Dead Sea Scroll or between LXX and Dead Sea Scrolls. There were only just like an insignificant variants between LXX and Masoretic. And we had the very long portion this week. Those are the variants and we are done for today. So. We'll close it out. Father Yah, we give thanks, we give praise to your great and mighty name. You are the great I am and we thank you, Father. We thank you. May you bless each and every one who hears or watches what we share. May it be a blessing to them, Father. May it encourage them. May it guide them. May it bring them closer to you, to a relationship. And may they bear fruit. And may they walk in righteousness in all faithfulness, Father. We ask these things so that you may be glorified in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.